Did any ancient civilizations predict today's artificial intelligence? The ongoing march of technology, particularly in artificial intelligence, might seem unpredictable. But as I'm watching artificial intelligence evolve and sink deeper and deeper into my day-to-day -day life, yesterday, just out of the blue, I thought there must be some kind of Mayan or like ancient equivalent to our modern day sci-fi stories, or at least something we can learn about the way that they thought about intelligence that was outside the realm of their normal human interactions. Even if it was described in terms of like a spirit or a god or in mother nature, or whatever it is. And that just got me really excited. So I spent the whole day researching it. And in this video, we're gonna be asking the question about whether or not past cultures predicted the modern incarnation of artificial intelligence. And if so, what form did it take? And is there any lessons that we can learn today? So there's a pattern. There's a bunch of different cultures that spun tales, that told stories, especially origin stories about something coming to life that wasn't alive in the first place. Non-living material infused with some kind of spirit or God or sensation and becoming life like. And I read into these as having some analogs to today's artificial intelligence. Like 10 years ago, if you looked at a microchip, a GPU, and a hard drive, you would never have thought, oh, that's something that might be able to do something like ChatGPT. But there's something about large language models, machine learning in general, neural networks especially, deep learning especially, that has that element of nothing at first and then evolving into something that's learning from the environment and making better and better decisions over time. Now in Greek mythology, the god Hephaestus, known for his craftsmanship, this god is actually known for creating automata. These are mechanical beings, basically like embodied robots with artificial intelligence. Now for Hephaestus, these were crafted out of metal, but they were smart and they could serve very various roles in the environment, from simple entertainment to complex guardianship. In fact, if you remember the legend of Talos, if that rings a bell, which is the bronze sentinel from Crete that was actually brought to life by Hephaestus. And there's definitely a thematic connection to modern day robots and these kind of stories, especially in terms of what it is to bring something to life that was inanimate before. And if we jump over to Jewish folklore, there's the story of Gollum, who was a figure that was originally made of clay and then animated through mythical means. But this one's probably more interesting than any other story I came across today because it was actually not intelligent, it was alive at first because its behavior was strictly dictated by the creator itself. That's why it's full of fascinating details about how the creator's instructions actually shaped its behavior, which seems so much like the way we train AI today. It even has hints of RLHF, the reinforcement learning that we use now with the human feedback to try to train it. But going beyond myths, we can actually look at historical records of early automated development. Like, have you seen this thing, the Antikythia mechanism? I mean, dude, it's worth looking up on your own anyways. Like, this made us rethink where technology was for the entire planet at this time. It is an ancient analog computer, and it's a testament to how advanced the ancient Greeks really were. It's a tool that could actually make predictions about where astronomical stars and planets would align in the future. So I would think that if you were smart enough to build something like that, you might keep going down the line in your own mind. If I add enough levers and knobs, could this start to predict anything? Which actually is kind of like a trillion parameter model. I mean, it's all digital, but it's a lot like a whole bunch of little knobs that just keep like moving around and shaping themselves to be a latent space or approximate a function or however you want to think about like fitting and overfitting a loss function and then learning from the mistakes or correct guesses that you make. And for this thing to actually be accurate, you know, they had to test it and make some predictions and it was wrong. And then they went back at the gears and said, okay, how does this thing need to be shaped to actually make an accurate prediction? It's the same story. We're just getting to a level of data and computation and complexity that makes these emerging properties. Okay, so now let's go find some writings that were more theoretical, hypothetical, more story driven, but they do kind of hint at a future that we're sort of stepping into. Like, have you heard of the Mahabharata, the ancient epic from India? Well, it's got references to chariots that move without horses, ahem, uh -huh, self-driving Tesla, and arrows that track their targets, like anything with computer vision, like missiles or whatever. And of course, we should throw some Nostradamus in here because everybody talks about how he, pre you know, predicts the future. And when I looked him up, there is a couple lines that he's written that most people say is a hint towards artificial intelligence, I'll let you be the judge. He said that those who are in the realm of adaption will be able to rise, seeing all, and growing underneath. First couple times I read it, I was like, I don't get it. And then I was like, oh, I kind of do see why people reference this. You know, because you're like tuning the model, you're tuning the parameters, basically back propagation. From that, something arises, which is kind of like how you just keep doing that. And all of a sudden GPT can start doing mathematics. And then seeing all is kind of like, whoa, because one of the craziest things about these like multimodal systems is that they can translate between things that usually seem untranslatable. It's not just like Spanish to French, but it can be Spanish to MRI or MRI to DNA 
DNA or DNA back to English. That's what's getting so weird about this. And Nostradamus says seeing all right there. And then for the kicker, growing underneath, which is like, that's what is like, whoa, what is about to emerge? Like, is there a real sentient life here that's just still kind of a seed or an embryo that's just popping into existence and when we see it we see it but it's like is it growing underneath it's just undetectable i don't know nostradamus gives me the willies to be honest so now let's go to some of the biblical interpretations because you might be surprised but there's a lot of biblical scholars that have already made a bunch of comparisons to modern day artificial intelligence in terms of what they read and understood from the bible and if you assume that humans possess these intrinsic values and we have true agency over our decisions because we were made in a divine image of god how should we take that same framework and apply it to something that might more and more seem like us that we created. The Bible also has a lot of emphasis on stewardship. Like being good stewards of the planet does not mean using these things to ruin the environment or hurt people. And of course, there's plenty of text, uh, both in the Bible and everywhere, about the ethics and morality of something like this. And we'll have lots of conversations on this channel about it, but how do you respect somebody's race, human dignity, avoid discrimination, all of that important kind of human stuff that promotes social good and does the most benefit possible for the most amount of people. Do not place undue importance on created things. I don't know if you actually create an intelligence that has its own world model and feels like a thing in the environment, if that should still apply or not. But you know, if it is just a thing, let's be careful. You know, there's also some emphasis in the Bible between the difference of wisdom and knowledge. Chat GPT, there is wisdom and knowledge, but in some sense, you know, there is a different level of wisdom that kind of sits on top of tools like this that it doesn't have yet. And just cause I'll go there, just cause it will go there. Just not, not, not because I'm like all about this, but actually, if you think about the very end of humanity revelations, there are some biblical scholars that have made the comparison about the sign or the mark of the beast, maybe being artificial intelligence and that being the big moment of revelation. I mean, there's a lot of things people are like, that could be the mark of the beast. So I don't want to go that far, but you know, there are some comparisons and this is a world changing technology. This is us, you know, messing around with some stuff that we have never messed around with before. Impacts that are way bigger than nuclear weapons. Like honestly, if you just want an interesting story, you should grab the audiobook for Frankenstein. You know, Mary Shelley wrote that in 1818 and it raises some of the most profound questions about what it is to be human. Especially what kind of ownership is on you if you choose to give life, what kind of ethical uh, considerations need to be like hanging over your head if you put life into something else. Basically the theme of humans playing God, you know? It's easy to envision, oh, once I have AI, I'll use it to like make money and everything will be good. But what about the other billion things that it can do that you maybe don't want as much? Have you thought through all of those? Probably not. And I'm sure that people at Microsoft and Meta and Google have not either. There's also a book from 1872 that's called Erwan, and it was written by this guy named Samuel Butler. And I found a lot of references to it when I was scripting this video today, especially because there's a chapter that's titled The Book of Machines. And Butler actually speculates on the evolution of machines, and it's really accurate to today. He talks about how they may one day reproduce, which really, when you think about these models being trained and then duplicated, and then they kind of evolve in separate ways, and then new data comes out of them to be trained in the next iteration, that's already happening. But he suggests from this kind of like environmental interaction and this reproduction that they could adapt to their environment, eventually becoming so adapted to the environment that it far surpasses humans. And it's funny because it was written about 10 years after Origin of the Species came out. So this is actually like a rebuttal to Darwin in a way. From what I understand, if you read it in that decade, it was more like satirical and it was kind of like Darwin and that evolution. What if machines go crazy and all of these things happen? But that is kind of what's happening, you know? But you can probably trace it back like approximately to about the 1950s. Alan Turing is often considered the father of modern AI. Because in 1948, he wrote this paper called Intelligent Machinery. This isn't something that like he put out there. Everyone's like, Alan Turing, the father of AI, this is crazy. Instead, he just wrote it and it got shelved. We discovered it later, but he waited for everyone else to like basically reinvent all that stuff if he would have just shared. And that was exactly why I wanted to make a video like this. I'm like, what has been said before that we have just like forgotten about that maybe we could just reapply today. But he had the idea of the digital neuron and the fact that it might be able to train and learn and all the things that we really use today, but he didn't publish it. So nobody knew it had to be all reinvented. That's what led to all these like ups and downs, the AI winters that AI has gone through. AI would get super hyped and then it wouldn't really like live up to the expectations and they would try to build all these like 
large data sets to help train it, but those didn't really help either. Like in the mid 1970s and the late 1980s, those are considered two like really depressive downtimes in the history of modern AI. But you know, it was, but there were limitations. They had to wait for computation and data to actually be abundant enough to do things with it. And it seems safe to say that we're in an AI renaissance. Like as somebody who keeps up with like AI news every single day, this is unbelievable. And it might keep going exponential. Maybe we do have a dip for a while, but it's, it's something special right now. And if it does go for that sort of fast takeoff scenario, then we're already pretty much at the end. But just to like bring a lot of this back down, what I've done in this video is all sorts of speculation and interpretation. I'm thinking about what people were said with the modern lens of knowledge that I have. Like for the ancients talking about automata, they were just devices of that era's ingenuity. Not exactly premonitions of today's digital future. I just see that there's parallels in the way they were thinking. But I will say one of the weirdest things about thinking about the, the past of AI, where spirituality was invoked to like make something come to life, and today where we're trying to say there might be an emergent property in a really gigantic data set of latent space and a highly tuned super parameterized AI model is that they both really aren't good explanations like explanations that you could list out like A leads to B they're not logical in a weird way sure it's more accurate to say chat GPT has you know all of these tokens and they're arranged mathematically in distance from each other so when you ask for something it just does all the measurements and gives you what you want but the fact that all of a sudden it can do math and it can pass the medical exam and it can pass the bar exam isn't quite the same thing in my head. They call it a black box, but it's mysterious. It's truly mysterious. You can prompt it over and over again and different weights, different initial conditions will completely change the output in big ways, but they all sort of make sense in a way. And even today, we have very few tools to look inside these systems to actually explain what's going on. That's an entire branch of AI research, like XAI, where it's like about explainable machine learning. But, but that is in its infancy, and I don't know if that will ever actually give us real answers. At the end of the day, you might always just be able to take my brain or your brain and put it in MRI and say, these connections make this kind of a person, but not say exactly what it is they're gonna think or do. It's just, it's just obscure because it's so complex. But we have that problem with humans too. Like you can put somebody trustworthy in charge of something, but you don't always know they're gonna make the right decision. And as we get super intelligent AI, it becomes better and better at being accurate, but I don't think we can ever know with certainty. It's always some statistical uncertainty in there, which leaves us kind of in the same place where we started with an unknown about what it is that turns inanimate life into real life. Help me get to 6,000 subscribers. Smash that subscribe button.